and then I will uh, make this uh, PowerPoint in a presentation mode so that you can see a little bit bigger screen. And if at any point you don't hear me well or you can't see my screen well, please just let me know right away so I can fix the situation for you. So uh, let's start this webinar to research stations. Uh, this will take about two hours. Uh, on the first hour, we will focus on uh, the situation update regarding the COVID pandemics and its effects on transnational and remote access. And then uh, if needed, we can have a little break in between so you can stretch your legs or pick some coffee or something. And then we'll continue the second hour on focusing on virtual access and the really important next steps and developments that are uh, happening in that field, in that front. So the content uh, of this webinar, as I mentioned, will start with the COVID update, uh, the current status, the current situation and the way forward. And then I will really shortly also tell about practical matters regarding the transnational access and remote access provision. And that is in case there are representatives of new stations in uh, transnational access provision so that you get a short overview about the procedures. However, this will be really short part of today's webinar because uh, it, it has become evident that majority of the field work will be cancelled or postponed from this summer. So we have still time uh, to provide you this detailed information about practical matters by email or we can even have a new webinar uh, focusing to the new stations in access provision. And then for the second hour, we move to the provision of virtual access. Uh, I will tell you about Interact's role as a network, as a project in the virtual, virtual access, access provision. Access provision. Now someone is having their uh, microphone uh, unmuted. Please check that you have muted your microphones. Thank you. And then I will also tell you about the station's role from the contractual point of view, what we have promised to do uh, to the EU when we have signed the grant agreement regarding virtual access provision. So what is uh, expected uh, from us in the TA coordination and what is expected from the stations who have promised to offer virtual access. Then we'll talk about some new opportunities that has raised in this uh, respect, what comes to virtual access. And then I would like to present you with an action plan, how we uh, plan to proceed with virtual access. And I really much welcome discussion or comments or feedback regarding that. So some of you have already seen this slide. I think I've sent it by email previously to, to all station managers. So this is in a nutshell, the uh, kind of way forward on the current situation we have regarding the COVID uh, effects on Interact transnational access. And we have also communicated this uh, slide and this information to our TA users, to all TA user groups. We have uh, sent this by email and we have also had a webinar with all TA users. So what we have done is that our main coordinator has uh, sought extension from our science officer in the commission uh, for Interact 2. And we are now waiting for the decision. When we originally applied this on the last week of March, uh, we were told that uh, the decision uh, will take about three weeks of time. And uh, yesterday we have sent a new uh, inquiry to the Commission regarding this and we are waiting for the res response will come soon and hopefully it will be positive so that we can extend Interact 2 funding period by uh, a little bit more than a year. So that would uh, give us time to, to utilize the uh, funding for Interact 2 as much as possible, also what comes to transnational access. 
what we have instructed our, the TA users and also the stations is that uh, it's wise to wait with any travel reservations uh, what comes to the access granted for this summer, summer 2020, or if it's absolutely necessary to make any travel arrangements at this point to book refundable or exchangeable tickets. We have also urged everyone to think of possibilities to shift from physical transnational access to remote access. We hope that this uh, would make it possible to, to conduct some, uh, some access, but of course we also realize that it's probably not going to be many projects that can be shifted from, from physical transnational to remote access. But at least we have wanted to make it clear that this is one opportunity that if the study is suitable to be done as remote access, then it is possible from our perspective if it's okay to the station. So then there are uh, two different lines of action, depending whether the extension is granted or not to interact to. So if the extension is granted, then the physical access uh, can be postponed or delayed to summer 2020 where needed. And at the moment, it really seems that this is what's going to happen to majority of the projects because many stations are closed uh, and there are so many travel restrictions still from the countries of the TA users and from the countries where the stations are located. So we are prepared to this in the TA coordination and it is okay. So no one has to feel bad consciousness if they have to postpone their study to 2021. Then this uh, second option here, extension to interact to is not granted. So in that case, it is of course as well okay to postpone the access granted for 2020 to summer 2021. But in this case, then we need to shift those projects who have been allocated funds from interact to, we will transfer them under interact three. So then the, the projects can be compensated from Interact 3 funds. Of course, then this means that you are already, the station's uh, budget, budget for Interact 3 TA is already eaten up then by these projects. But it, in any case, uh, it means that we can still support the projects who were granted access for this summer. So in, in any, if any of these possibilities takes place in any ways, we have secured the projects that have already been granted access. So uh, overall, what is foreseen for summer 2020 is that uh, some uh, physical access can be transferred to remote access projects and conducted already this summer. And this is done by agreement between the station and the TA user. And then uh, once this agreement has been reached between the TA users and station then among themselves, then you can just inform me or Heli uh, in the TA coordination so that we know. And then some and actually most of the physical ac access is likely to be postponed to summer 2021. And of course, uh, what we are planning to do now is that we give a strong push uh, to the utilization and development of the virtual access. So that even though there's not so much happening in the field in summer 2020, at least we have something to offer. We have virtual access and freely available data to offer to the scientists meanwhile. And also the stations could uh, focus their efforts in development of virtual access during this time when there's not so many resources allocated to practical field work. So the next, next steps concerning the COVID-19 mitigation and effects on transnational access is that- Mary, we... can, I, can I have a question? Yes, absolutely. Regarding please. the last slide, because yeah. you, you, you are, uh, you showed us different scenarios of postponing, transferring to uh, remote access and so on, to mm -hmm. access, but uh, there will be perhaps cases when the project will take place this year, right? I mean, you also, I mean, 
and say this out loud that some projects might work out in 2020. Yeah, and that is great. And okay. that is great. And I really appreciate then these efforts that if it can be arranged to happen this summer. And that's, of course, it's, it's only positive. But, uh, but uh, we also respect that the safety concerns, of course, and the national legislation and the travel restrictions have, have to be taken into account. But if these uh, conditions or requirements are taken into account and everything can be done safely and according to national uh, rules and, and, and regulations, then it is only positive and absolutely fine. Thanks for your comment. Uh, Hanni, this is Torben here. I yeah. just have a f quick follow up on yeah. this. Um, does that also mean, I assume it also means that if some of the TA projects might uh, be feasible in just shifting the timing towards the end of the year, although yeah. it's early winter, uh, yeah, yeah. This, this should be okay as well, right? That's, that's also that it's just even better. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, so all, all these different adjustments are, are uh, good and okay. And it's really nice that the stations and the TA users are seeking for to find different solutions to this situation. Uh, so the next steps, uh, so we are waiting for the decision uh, on extension of Interact 2. And I'm, I'm very positive that it, we will receive it in April. And in any case, we will let you know right away as soon as we get the decision. So we will let you know. So then, then everyone is on the same page. And also, uh, when we get the decision on the extension, we let you know the, the decision and we let you know what it means in practice. So everyone knows also what's going to follow uh, on, on the decision, whether it's granted the extension or not. So, and here you can also see that uh, that the information on the shift from physical access to, to remote access or the postponements of the visits in uh, within uh, year 2020 or the postponements to uh, 2021. So, so I think uh, all these different solutions are possible and good, and it all really depends on the agreement between the TA users and the stations. How do you together see uh, it, it, what is the best solution uh, in, in case of the station and in case of the TA project? And of course, then the, and for us, all these different solutions are okay, and we can handle the situation, and we just need to, to know then what, what is your decision uh, on, on these delays or postponements or shifts from transnational to remote access? So what we recommend that is done now is that uh, very many of you have probably already heard from those projects who were granted access for summer 2020. And I also know that many of you have already contacted those projects who were granted access for summer 2020 to ask what is the plan, what is the way forward. But if you have not heard from those projects yet, or you have not yet contacted them, now it would be a really good time to do it. So I hope that you, station managers, uh, email to the project leaders of the projects who were granted access to your station this summer and ask about how does the situation look for them and tell how does the situation look for you? How does it look at the station? And, and then you find together uh, the way when the project will be conducted and uh, conducted and how it will be conducted. Miguel Handele, may I have a question? Mm -hmm. Would you think that there, there should be a deadline for the project leaders to make up, to make the final decision when they want to stop trying to uh, make it work this year? Uh, I think it depends on you. It depends on when do you need to know it uh, as a station. Because of course at some point then they should book some, book some flights and stuff like that. So I think really it, it is at least what you can set a deadline is that you, you can say when you expect to hear from them so that you can continue the discussion and planning whether it would be. So I, I, I'm really not able to give you any certain deadline. It really a lot depends on your station, how much in advance you should need to know. And then of course, 
it's very unclear so, situation in the sense that also I think many scientists do not know because we don't know when the travel restrictions will be lifted away. But Hanele, from, from Interact's view, it's, it's okay if we prolong this decision. Yeah, it is absolutely if okay. we see some yeah. uh, hope that it yeah, might work it out is absolutely year. okay. okay. But, but from the TA coordination point of view, uh, it is only important that we know then, you know, how the situation develops and that we have some certain uh, time when we know at least the situation at that time. And that is why I recommend that you will contact the TA projects in April and you can, for example, ask them to, to let you know in a couple of weeks time, how does the situation look uh, for them at the moment? It can be changed, but at least you have some answer, some expectation if it's going to be in the autumn or if it's going to be next summer or so. Uh, and, and then uh, what, we, what I and Heli here in the TA coordination are going to do is that we will send you email and we ask you the overall situation uh, if there will be any shifts from uh, transnational access to remote access and uh, how does it look at the moment, how many of the projects are planning to visit you in the autumn, for example, and how many have already decided to postpone to 2021. So we will send you email about this in and ask about this in May. So we hope that, that uh, when this email is reaching you, then you have already been in contact with the, the TA users and you at least know their plans. How does the situation look like? And then uh, we hope that you respond to us in the TA coordination during May and, and give us the information. You can simply list the projects that were granted access uh, to your station in the summer and then you can indicate that this project is planned to be done in remote access, this project has planned to uh, delay to October, this project has planned to do it in summer 2021. And, and why we are asking an update about the situation is that then we can start planning uh, if we need to reallocate some projects uh, between, from Interact 2 to Interact 3. And we know, you know, if we need to keep the budget allocations at a certain time or uh, if we need to reduce the budget allocation because a remote access project is usually much cheaper than uh, physical transnational access. So in that case, we could a little bit reduce the budget allocation and so. So it is kind of an update that we hope to have uh, during May from you. And then also we will use that information when we know how many projects uh, we anticipate to have already uh, then uh, transferred to summer 2021. We can use that information when we are planning the opening of the next TA call. Because as you know, we usually have TA calls open uh, from August until October for the following summer. And if we already know then at this stage when the call should open that, okay, there will already be so many projects in 2021, when, the, when we then need to make a decision, for example, if we are only going to open the next call for remote access projects or so on. Because if, if so many projects are already going uh, to the field in summer 2021, it might be that your station doesn't have capacity to host a twice amount of projects as normal during one field season. So we can use the information to adjust uh, the specifications for the next TA call. And then I have lightened up this uh, next, the last bullet point, next transnational access call opens in August, September with a little bit lighter shade because then uh, that's something that we still uh, can't say 100% sure how it will be like. So. That is, that is um, something where this uh, information we gather and the updates we make during the, the summer and spring uh, will affect on. Are there any questions about uh, this COVID situation still? 
If not, then we will proceed with the, in the program. And if some questions come into your mind later on, you can just submit your question in the chat, or then you can also send email about very specific issues. Then here is only one slide about these practical matters regarding transnational access and remote access provision. So I'm starting the first bullet point uh, starts from the point when access has been granted to a project. And they are preparing to the uh, access visit to your station. So the process is going so that the TA users make their own travel arrangements themselves. And they, and they have been informed that when they make the travel arrangements, they have to keep within the budget allocation that has been granted for the project in the access decision. And of course, here in the TA coordination, we do not know all the details, how to reach the stations and so on. So that is why we have also advised TA users that if they have uh, questions regarding uh, practical questions, how to reach the station and so on, they should contact the stations for advice regarding travel arrangements. Also, uh, it is under the responsibility of the TA users to apply any permissions or licenses themselves. But uh, also in that regard, they can ask for advice from the station because usually the stations know the best the local conditions and if any specific permits are needed and so on. So travel arrangements, licenses, permits are responsibility of the TA users within the granted budget, but in consultation and under advice from the station. Well, then next bullet point is the, is the practical access visit or the remote access sample collection that is done by the station staff. And after the visit, uh, there, the TA users have about eight weeks time to submit their project report in InterAccess. And we recommend that the stations only pay the travel reimbursement after you have seen that the project report has been submitted to InterAccess. This is to ensure that we have some documentation of the access visit, uh, because we need to provide the documentation to the EU Commission. And of course, we want to learn about the success and the results of the, of the transnational access that has been granted. Uh, so uh, after the project has submitted the project report, then they can uh, prepare and submit a travel claim of the travel costs. And each and every individual should submit a personal travel claim. So if they have paid their travel costs themselves with their own money, then they prepare a personal travel claim for every person and to every station they have visited. And uh, they can use or they should use the station's own travel uh, reimbursement forms for that. And also, in general, they are following your practices and your forms and your instruction on how to prepare and submit the travel claim. And that is because it is the station or the institution that is operating the station who is uh, paying the travel reimbursement. So that is why they also need to follow your practices in this financial administration. The second option here is that uh, for some users, it is their institution who is buying the flights or paying for the travel costs before the access visit. So in, in that case, uh, it is not the person who is preparing the travel claim, but it is their institution who prepares an invoice and then sends the invoice to the station or to the institution who is operating the station. So. So then this travel reimbursement is made by institutional invoice. So that, those are those two options that you use for travel reimbursements. And there is a lot of more uh, detailed information about these travel reimbursements, how they are made and at what stage. And we have compiled uh, what are the eligible costs, what costs are not uh, reimbursed. 
so that they are not eligible costs. So we have compiled everything to this little booklet. It's called Information to Research Stations. And we are at the moment updating that. There are not going to be many changes, but we anyhow want to check all our instruction against the Commission uh, financial guidelines. So as soon as we have done that, we will send this information to research station booklet to all station managers and you can then forward uh, the booklet to your uh, administrators. It is only a couple pages long and it really contains all the essential information you need in order to, to handle these uh, practical matters in time and according to the EU guidelines. So you can expect to receive uh, this booklet by email in May. Do you have any questions about this practical arrangement about physical access or remote access provision? If not, then we are ready to move forward. So now we start talking about these new opportunities. So it's not only bad things that uh, are happening because of this uh, COVID-19 pandemics. There are also some new opportunities, new, of course, also some new challenges, but but we are, have decided to take a positive look and also see the good sides uh, of this catastrophe. So uh, something new uh, that has been um, emerging, not completely a new thing, but something that we have decided to advance and, and take a stronger push in advance is the development of virtual access. And we have been already providing virtual access in Interact 2. And that has been a, in a very basic form. So the, the idea, of course, behind this whole virtual access is to make the data uh, and metadata from the stations available freely and openly online to any user who wish to use it. And then, of course, uh, we stress out also that uh, even though it's freely available, we hope to have uh, attribution so that the provider of the data, if there will be any publications, for example, resulting from virtual access data use, uh, is acknowledged. So if some scientist is using station data for their publication, then they should acknowledge and recognize uh, that uh, the station whose data has been used. Or of course, even in, in the best case scenario, to involve the station in the um, writing of the article or analyzing the, the data. So ultimately our aim in Interact Virtual Access Provision is to follow these FAIR guiding principles and that means that our aim is to make the data from the stations findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And uh, we have decided now to advance our virtual access single entry point development. In Interact 2, the system has been really basic. It has basically been, a, the single entry point has been a table on the Interact website with descriptions of the data available and the metadata available and links to the station's own uh, data portal or data center or the data set that they are pro providing for virtual access. But we are now going to develop that to a much nicer form that is much more user friendly and also makes uh, the data and information on the station's own data portal much more visible and it's kind of makes it available on the interact network level for the users to find data and metadata in a much better way and make more advanced searches and so on. So we, our consortium partner in Italy, uh, in code, who will, who will also give a presentation in this webinar, is leading this development of the virtual access single entry point on the Interact website. And they are doing that in collaboration with the Interact data team. 
And that uh, data team consists of representatives from the TA coordination. It is me who is involved very closely in this process. We have a data safeguard who is very experienced, very internationally recognized expert in this field of data management. You probably know Eusten um, from, from previous um, interactions. And then, uh, of course, we also want to do collaboration with you, with the stations who are providing virtual access so that we can help and support you in the best possible way to provide virtual access. And we are using these fair guiding principles also uh, in order to ensure that uh, this uh, virtual access single entry point, uh, the, new, the new version of it, the better, the more improved version of it is interoperable with all the other interact systems because we have the interaccess system for the online uh, TA applications and evaluations and reporting. And then also we have the interact GIS system that is the, um, the management system for the stations for their coordination of access. So we want these systems to be interoperable so that they are kind of talking with, with each other, which then means that the station, for example, doesn't have to enter the same information to the different systems many times. But it is that if there is information in one system, it can be retrieved and utilized in the other system. So that is our ultimate aim and we are building this new version of interact, uh, this virtual access uh, single entry point so that it would be interoperable with the other systems that already exist. So as I mentioned, we have decided to take this push to advance the virtual access single entry point development and we hope that you at the stations would do the same regarding virtual access provision. Uh, and why we, why we are hoping and encouraging that is that you all have a available budget, quite plenty of budget, many of you, for virtual access provision in Interact 3, and you can already start using it now. And, and we also hope that and, and, and envision that this uh, push advancement with the virtual access provision would help to bring some more activity and new activity to your station when majority of the field work has been cancelled or postponed, delayed from summer 2020. And we also hope that uh, these de developments in virtual access provision would help uh, to give scientists access to data from the interact stations even in this situation when majority of their field work has been cancelled from uh, 2020 or postponed to 2021. So we can also see many benefits in this situation and we hope that now everyone will seize the opportunity and we'll do it together so that, that everyone can help and support each other. A couple of words about the interact virtual access, about the concept of the virtual access. So uh, we offer virtual access in interact through our uh, virtual access single entry point, as I mentioned already, and it is located at the interact website. And the first version, the current version was basically done by me. It's technically absolutely not advanced, it's very simple, but the next version is going to be much better uh, and much improved and very much more user friendly and that will be developed by Incode, who has already developed our inter-access system by the way. And the station's role in this virtual access provision uh, at the interact virtual access single entry point is to provide us with the metadata, the discovery metadata, uh, so, uh, so that uh, your data that you provide uh, do, uh, through virtual access can be found and searched in this virtual access single entry point. So that is what we uh, would need to uh, get from you, this discovery metadata of your station's data sets that you offer through virtual access. 
And it's very important that you recognize that the data itself, as well as the metadata, it will be hosted at your station or at the data center or portal where you provide the data. So we are not trying to hijack the data from you. You, you have the ownership to your own data and, and you host it yourself. But we simply would like to have the metadata information so that your data would be, um, could be harvested and the metadata could be harvested uh, to be provided and made more visible through the Interact virtual access single entry point. It will, be, uh, it will make it much easier to the users to find uh, the data not only at the station level, but also on the whole Interact network level, because all the data and information can then be found from the same point through the virtual access single entry point. And uh, here is then also just a short uh, definition. What is this discovery metadata? I'm talking about here. So it is basically like an index card in the library. It describes what uh, it, it describes the data when it has been collected and what kind of data it is and where it has been collected and different kind of information like that and where it is hosted, where it is available. And then this, this discovery metadata uh, the index card in the li data library then is guiding the user to where to find the data and that they they know if they are seeking a specific kind of data they know uh, that they have found it when they read uh, the metadata description and each virtual access providing station has individual budget allocation and you can yourself utilize that budget allocation in Interact 3 to develop their own virtual access provision. Uh, for example, if you like to digitize some data or you like to, to work on your data management system or something like that. Uh, and what we are expecting from you uh, in return of the funding that that has been allocated to you, your station in Interact 3, is that you provide us with this uh, discovery metadata so that we can make it available in this virtual access single entry point. And uh, what is also expected is that with this uh, virtual access funding, you really make concretely data available freely online it can be on in your own data portal, but that there really concretely is some data available somewhere so that it's not just that the whole search is ending to uh, please email to this person to get the data. Okay. So there should be a concrete data available somewhere. So uh, this discovery metadata, then once, we, once, once you have it uh, and once you have exposed it uh, to our system, uh, then that is harvested from your station's repository or data uh, center to this Interact virtual access single entry point. And you will be contacted, instructed and supported to collaborate with the metadata harvesting with InCode. So we try to really make everything so practical and simple as possible so that this process of the metadata uh, harvesting would go as smoothly as possible. Uh, and uh, the station's role in this process, in the metadata harvesting that has been starting now actually, is to collaborate with us uh, and you can compensate the costs from your own virtual access budget. You have been allocated person months and other direct costs for that. So if you have any personnel that would be then working on this metadata uh, harvesting, um, testing and trial, then you can charge those person months from your virtual access uh, budget. 
and I don't expect that it will be actually very much effort if you have trained uh, IT personnel. They know they know this process, and and uh, it will not be a technically very difficult process, I believe. And I also would like to remind you that uh, this task, the development of virtual access single entry point, and the related metadata harvesting, it is contractual. It is in our grant agreement uh, with the Commission for Interact 3 that we have promised to do this. And uh, part of the partner's uh, virtual access budget allocation should be devoted to this. So we really hope that, uh, that we all will uh, work jointly and, and collaborate to have this task, to have this what we have promised fulfilled. So everyone who has budget in virtual access uh, should be providing something uh, information, metadata, perhaps even uh, at some point the data, if, if that is your wish, uh, through the virtual access single entry point. And the next steps regarding virtual access uh, provision is that we have now started this virtual access single entry point development, the next generation of the of the single entry point uh, within code. And we are all also now initiating the discovery metadata harvesting. And we have been seeking and asking pilot contributors of this metadata. Uh, and, so, and we have approached some stations already and they have asked uh, promised to collaborate with us uh, to, to start uh, working on and testing this metadata harvesting. And we are still going to approach more stations individually to ask to join uh, in this uh, pilot and, and to, to get started with this metadata harvesting. And we, of course, warmly welcome volunteers. So if you feel like your station uh, would like to join already at this stage, to work on this metadata harvesting, please let us know. You can contact me or you can contact INCODE. We will provide you with all contact information at any point and we welcome all contributions and collaboration regarding this matter. Uh, we will send you, the station managers, an email and ask you to update us with the information on persons who are working with virtual access at your station. So we basically ask the person's name and email address, and then you tell it to us so that we know the most recent uh, situation, who is the correct contact person to be approached regarding virtual access provided at your station. And once we get the person's name and email address from you, we will uh, form an email distribution list and then we will uh, send them email and information and we plan to arrange a webinar specifically for the station virtual access contact persons or these IT people who are working with the data provision at your station and that should take place in early to mid June. And we believe that this really helps when we have all the experts meeting in a webinar and they can discuss in these technical terms and get like really hands on uh, to this metadata harvesting issues, selection of uh, standards uh, for, to ensure interoperability and so on. So I think that's a very good way forward and a very important webinar to be arranged. So that was my presentation. Uh, here you can see the contact information to us. So if you have any uh, concerns or questions what uh, relates to uh, transnational or remote access and also virtual access, you can always contact me or Heli. We work here in the TA coordination for that to support you and help you. And then if you have uh, matters that are related to virtual access uh, provision, the technical part of it, 
especially or to the inter access system you want to give feedback or you have any technical problems you can contact in code and you can uh, see the email address of their help desk here on this slide and the response time, I have to say, is very fast with code. There are three people working on these issues, so, so you can expect that we will come back very soon to you, both from the TA coordination and code, and do our best to help and support you. If you don't have any questions about these issues now, then I would like us to continue uh, and focus a little bit more on the virtual access. And I would now like to invite Raoul from INCODE to give a presentation about the uh, virtual access development so that you will get some uh, overview about uh, the plans regarding that. A little bit uh, more about the technical aspects as well and also about the next steps, the kind of the approach that we have chosen for the development of virtual access single entry point. Please, Raoul, you can start uh, sharing your screen. And if you also want to share your camera, that's, that's OK. I will now turn my camera off. Here I am. Hello. Hello. We can hear you very well. OK, great. Um, hello, everybody. For um, um, People that don't know me, I'm Raul from Incode. I'll be giving this presentation on the uh, VA single entry point, trying to address all your questions uh, about uh, on the platform. Um, feel free to interrupt me uh, at any point. The goal here really is to uh, leave this presentation with no doubts uh, about the platform. Uh, and here you can see um, our, our email for our help desk. As Hanele was, was saying, we're always available to address any question about the platform. And uh, if you may need any help, we're always available. Okie dokie. Okay, the VA single entry point. What is the VA single entry point? Um, our goal here is to create a platform uh, in which um, all data sets can be easily, easily um, searchable. Um, all stations adhering to the Interact uh, uh, project uh, will be able to submit discovery metadata and we'll get um, to that uh, as we go on with the presentation on what um, meta metadata and discovery metadata is. Um, but it will allow us to catalog and easily search uh, multiple data sets provided by different entities. And why is that? Well, um, we find ourselves right now in a situation where uh, data is available and it's uh, consumable, but finding the data is... Uh, is difficult, um, d primarily because it is scattered across multiple, uh, multiple hosts, and these hosts provide different standards. Uh, so uh, an automatization to consume the data um, usually is, is, quite, is quite difficult. Um, data sets are difficult to obtain and research across multiple data sets. Um, and um, I've, I've taken the chance in these um, past weeks to um, try to access um, few, a few of, of, the, of the data sets. And uh, in some cases, uh, the access is quite difficult because it is, uh, you have to request it via email or um, it, it is not straightforward. You, you can't go to directly to the data and consume the data. So, uh, we understand that uh, stations want to maintain control over their, um, their data. Um, and so what we're essentially doing is um, giving the possibility of collecting and indexing the metadata. Um, and through the metadata, people then can go and access the data. Um, 
so essentially what we're doing is creating a single searchable entry point to access and host multi-set metadata from various entities. Okay, so we all know what data is. Uh, it's uh, multiple sets of uh, 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 an information, um, usually based on uh, an observation. So um, uh, it could be um, something that are, um, it, it could be um, a set of values that are qualitative or quantitative, quantitative uh, variables. But what is metadata? Well, um, metadata, as the word suggests, as the etymology suggests, is data about data. It provides the information about a data set. Uh, so the what, the when, the how, the who collected it, where it was collected, the, the time frame in which it was collected. Um, um, in this example right here, um, the data is represented by the picture of the cat. So the, um, all the pixels that um, form this, this picture, uh, picture uh, is what is known as the data. But as here, as you can, can see, the metadata describes this picture. What's the name of the picture? Who took the picture? When it was taken? Uh, how big is the file? Um, the metadata that we are operating, operating with is descriptive, descriptive metadata. Um, and if, if we wanna be more specific, it's discovery metadata. Uh, what descriptive metadata is, is uh, metadata that describes a, a resource for the purpose of discovery or identification. So in this case, what we're interested in is describing the data we're dealing with and uh, defining where the data is stored. Hanele was pointing out before that um, we try to follow the, the fair guiding principles and it, it, really the goal of this, uh, um, of this project is, is to, to follow the, the um, uh, fair guiding principles. Um, the data management principles, uh, the fair guiding principles, uh, help researchers uh, track their data and handle it and store it in a more sustainable way. Um, FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interop interoperable, and reusable. And uh, here um, are uh, more elaborated uh, um, guidelines. Um, for the purpose of this pre presentation, I will not be uh, reading, but uh, I, I see that Giorgio, uh, um, who works with me at ENCODE, has provided you um, with, uh, um, with a link to the, um, to the presentation. And so uh, feel free to um, go and, and read uh, more in depth on what the FAIR um, guiding principles are. Um, metadata standards, great. Um, so we were talking about metadata. It describes data, uh, but a, what is a standard? What is a metadata standard? What a meta, meta standard is, is uh, an agreed requirement uh, uh, in which uh, metadata is defined um, by a, a defined set of semantics uh, to ensure correct and proper use and interpretation of the data by its owners and its users. Um, so a number of characteristics are defined uh, uh, or have to be defined in order to comply to a metadata standard. Um, I have prepared uh, an example here. 
this is um, one of the most uh, used uh, metadata standards um, in Spire. Uh, it was um, developed by the European Union to um, um, achieve, uh, establish an infrastructure for spatial information. Um, it's geared to, to, to help to make spatial and geographical information more accessible and interoperable. So by defining a set of, of values that uh, have to be uh, defined, um, here we go. For example, there you go. This is a Inspire file. Uh, as you can see, there are some fields that are standardized uh, and by um, adhering to, the, to this standard, um, usually interoperability is achieved. This is Hannele, but I hope we are not asked to fill in this kind of code. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely not. Good. No, absolutely not. Um, usually this, this part of uh, more technical part is, is taken care by either scripts or um, yeah, programs that are made to, because as you can see, it, it is quite complicated. Yes, exactly. That's very good, good to know. And abstract, yes. So, so um, we've had the chance to, to talk to Oysten uh, yesterday about um, the standard that we will be utilizing. Uh, the problem here lies in the fact that um, we understand that the stations uh, might have multiple um, metadata standards that uh, they use and uh, uh, it is uh, difficult to adhere to a single standard and especially when a lot of data is uh, already present on, uh, on uh, a data management system, it is uh, difficult to convert all the data just to adhere to one single um, metadata standard. Because really the, the problem with metadata standards is that um, many times there are, um, um, a single metadata standard can't be descriptive enough for the data set you are working with. So some people use schema.org, some people use uh, ISO 19115, um, depending on the type of data people are, are operating with. So um, as, as we will see later on in the presentation, uh, we have provided a few ways in which state, stations and VAs can uh, access and interact with the platform uh, so that they can still share their metadata with us without necessarily complying to a single standard. Uh, this is Hannele. Can I just comment that isn't this kind exactly the topic that is like really uh, when we have the webinar to the, the station personnel who are working with virtual access, you, could, you can then focus on and discuss these matters exactly. This yes. Metadata. Yeah, that's very good. And then exactly. And also we can kind of give a uh, information or kind of a workshop how to expose your metadata Absolutely. for this harvesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so um, we are still in the process of discussing uh, a metadata standard that would uh, describe in the broadest way possible uh, the, the data that we are dealing with. Uh, and uh, Oysten um, smartly suggested to use uh, uh, GCMD DIF, um, but that is, is, is still in the, the process, and uh, is still a decision that we we have to uh, we have to take, and we have to take in consideration uh, many aspects. Uh, one of of, of uh, like, for example, um, what the stations are operating with at the moment. Okay, so taking a step back, who produces and where are the data? So um, there's two types of uh, data producers that interact with the, with the platform. Stations are usually stable partners 
with many data sets. Um, they, they will have direct access to the metadata repository. And um, we will try as much as possible to automate uh, the metadata ingestion. And uh, in the following sl slides, we will um, go a little bit more in, in depth on how we intend to achieve that. TA users, users are usually occasional uh, data providers. There are scientists on, on the field and mm, they need to uh, be able to um, provide the metadata without dealing with a, a whole pl plethora of uh, technical uh, things that they have to interact with. So uh, what we're striving to do is to um, create a, a platform and I am more specifically a, a UI that um, makes the metadata submission as easy as possible. Uh, a guided interface to enter data, descriptions, metadata, uh, and be as simple as possible so it, it, it really can be used as by as much people uh, as possible, even without a lot of technical lot, uh, knowledge. So uh, usually data is uh, either uh, hosted by the institution or the entity that um, um, has conducted the study. Um, in some cases, it's already collected and indexed uh, by more advanced systems. And in some cases, it is um, not available at all uh, to the public. So it's usually stored on, on hard drives in uh, formats that uh, um, usually are not standardized um, and usually there's, um, uh, the, the data is stored, but the metadata is, is not. Um, so these are the, are the data provide, how the, the data is stored. So um, use case one, uh, harvesting metadata from stations data with a manual metadata description. So as I was saying, much of the data we're dealing with is already hosted by a researching organization. Um, our goal is to, um, to make this, this data available uh, through the, the metadata that the institutions provide. Um, we already have um, taken the chance to um, create a, a, a test, test environment in which to um, test this, uh, this situation. Uh, so uh, in, in this test environment, uh, there's a hier hierarchical structure and the uh, uh, organizations uh, have um, uh, in, this, in this platform, they have uh, the possibility to um, upload their metadata and link directly um, to, to the, the data that is being described. Um, so basically what, what is happening is, happening is this, the, meta, uh, the, um, the data is being described uh, via a form, a standardized form, um, and it is then indexed by the platform. Um, of course, we, we, we will try to automate this uh, process as much as possible. So we, we would like to arrive to a point in which uh, manual metadata description is as sparse as possible, because uh, we understand that um, data entry can be uh, tedious and uh, it really is inefficient if we can find a way to fully automate uh, every step of, of the process uh, that would um, would definitely be desirable. Uh, so in summary, um, data is, um, is made available by the, the entity and is described manually with a form. Yeah, and then the fo form will be such that it kind of gives in instructions and examples what kind of information is meant. So it's, it, we try to make it as easy as possible to be filled, even though someone would be not a very specialist in this 
uh, metadata description. Exactly. And further on in the presentation, we will have a chance to see how the platform looks and uh, uh, how, how this form will be filled. Yes. So use case two, uh, harvesting metadata from uh, stations with uh, uh, data management, management systems. So um, some stations are equipped with modern uh, uh, data management systems. And this would make the whole metadata harvesting process uh, a lot uh, easier, uh, easily um, automated, um, it could be easy, easily automized. automized. Um, what we're trying to achieve here is um, create a network of automated uh, metadata collections uh, points that di interact directly with the platform. So uh, with, a, with a few changes um, or with, with simple tasks anyway, um, what we can, we can achieve is that uh, by adhering to a set standard of, of, of metadata, um, all of, of the, the collecting process can be automated. Um, of course, we will thoroughly, thoroughly uh, discuss um, on access protocols, uh, how we intend to access the data and uh, the metadata standards that we intend to adopt. Because um, having to interact with uh, uh, multiple standards here is um, quite a difficult task. Uh, it's uh, not very feasible. If, if we intend to go, uh, if, if we intend to follow this route, what we should achieve is to um, adhere to a single standard, uh, a descriptive standard of, of metadata. So in summary, um, by making small changes, we can connect the data management systems with the platform so that they collect data and metadata and automatically submit it to the platform via a standardized metadata schema. Okay, so while in this case, the data is harvested by the platform, in this case, uh, stations automatically upload the data and the metadata. Um, in this case, the, the metadata standards are a little bit more loose. Uh, that's because we will be providing to the stations uh, various APIs in which, with which uh, stations will be able to interact with the platform. And by implementing those APIs, um, you can then uh, decide which standard uh, to use. Um, in the case, if you have already data with a set standard, uh, by implementing the APIs, you can uh, automate all the, the upload of, of said data. Of course, going forward, we, we strongly suggest that we find a, a single um, uh, a single standard to which we we, we would like to adhere, um, because it really does make the difference in uh, in in the the operations uh, in 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 the back end. What does the API stand for? Um, okay, so the API. Um, it's uh, it stands for application programming interface. Okay. It's it's a uh, it's a set of of uh, functions uh, in which um, uh, stations can in interact with the platform. So by implementing uh, certain actions, um, the interaction be between two systems can be automated. Thanks. This is the last case, collecting data and metadata from TA users. So as, as I was explaining earlier, um, TA users usually um, don't uh, submit as much, as much uh, data and um, 
usually it's uh, single researchers that have to um, submit the data in in a, in a, usually the the people that that are more technical with their field of study more than um, the standards and the technologies used to submit said data uh, and so what we we strive to do here is to to make the the platform as simple as possible uh, in order to make the um, submission um, process as, as smooth as possible so um, TA users will still be able to use all methods that um, were mentioned earlier um, but we expect most TA users to uh, use the form to describe the metadata and um, the platform to directly upload the data. I could add that I think this case uh, is something that has been not been happening a lot, as Raul already mentioned, but I think this is the future. This is where the situation is going to, and this is the wish by the European Commission as well to really encourage and expand this uh, data uh, to be shared so that the scientists working with support from transnational access would share their data, perhaps at later stage, stage after they have published the data first themselves but but i think this is some uh, direction where the situation is going what comes to the sharing of data so we want to be here kind of among the first ones to encourage and and make it possible for the ta users to to provide open access data absolutely uh, so in this case um TA users have direct access to the platform and they sub submit directly to the platform. The data uh, can be either linked to the platform or uh, directly uploaded. And so metadata and, and, uh, and data in this case uh, will, will or can be hosted directly by the, the platform. Data, data licenses, okay. This is an important one. <laughs> Um, we understand that multiple data licenses are used to um, uh, to describe uh, uh, data sets and how one can operate with uh, set some bounds on how uh, other people can uh, operate with with uh, the data sets that are, are being shared um, natively our platform will, will, um, um, will allow to, um, to choose the most popular data licenses, such as Creative Commons, Open Data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we understand that in some cases that might not be enough. Uh, people might want to uh, impose their own data licenses. And so, um, we're considering a functionality that will allow um, the user or the admin to submit uh, their own uh, uh, data license uh, so that they can protect their, their data um, with it. Um, so technically, uh, there is no limit to the data licenses that will be usable. Of course, we expect these data licenses to uh, always adhere to the, the fair uh, guiding principles. Um, okay, so as I was saying earlier, uh, what are the main challenge, challenges in, in developing uh, this platform? Um, well, the, the main, uh, um, the main uh, challenge here is dealing with multiple standards um, of, of metadata, uh, oper operating with different schemas. Um, it, it does make the searching process uh, a little harder for us. Uh, of course, it's uh, something that we're willing to uh, address. Uh, we, um, but what, we, what we, we ask here is, um, uh, is to, to set a common goal to find a standard that will, will be used to describe all the data sets going forward 
that are automatically inserted in the platform. We understand that in, in some cases, uh, this is not feasible as a standard, um, as, as I was mentioning earlier, in some cases can, can be not descriptive enough and uh, uh, not uh, indicated for a set, uh, a certain data set. Uh, and so the platform will allow um, all the, the meta metadata schemas that, um, that the stations, um, it, will, it will offer support for any metadata schema, schema that uh, the stations intend to use. But uh, we should, we should um, set the goal of finding the standard that, that will be used. Um, we also ask stations to have um, a high level of involvement um, in, in per participate in the harvesting process and provide the, the metadata description of the data sets they intend to uh, insert in the platform. Um, it's, it's by working with each other that we can uh, make the, the best possible platform. Uh, we're really striving to um, address any of your concerns, uh, any of your problems, uh, really uh, adapt the, the platform to the, the needs of the station. Um, but in doing so, we need your help. We need, uh, we need communication so we can achieve this in, in the best possible manner. Yeah, that's really nicely said, uh, Raul, and I think you have done really great job already in, in code in planning this and very uh, adopted this straightforward and very practical approach that I really highly appreciate, as well as uh, I really highly appreciate Oysten's comments and feedback on this and that he has supported this approach that we've taken um, in, in building this uh, new platform, Virtual Access Single Entry Point. And I think then uh, once we have this updated list of our virtual access contact persons and we create the emailing list and then we can really start to get Get the communication going on and have the webinars to, to really discuss on this uh, and, uh, and kind of overcome these main challenges that you identify here. I'm sure that the end results will be really good. Uh, absolutely. And uh, as I was mentioning earlier, um, our help desk is always available for any concerns that you may have. Any questions? Uh, it is operated by uh, three employees at Incode and we're we try to be as responsive as possible and uh, as informative as possible. Uh, um, so really for any problem uh, or any question, do send us an email. We will try to, to get back as soon as possible. Uh, we will try to address your, your problem. And station man managers can also provide this email address uh, and contact information to your own IT people if you already know who they are. So also then they know. Uh, who to contact and of course they will be contacted by us as well okay so um to summarize um i've made a a, a small uh, uh small schema describing the steps uh, uh this in the decision making for for the stations um if the station exposes standardized metadata we can automate the harvesting. So ENCODE actively, actively um, takes part in, in the harvesting of the data. The stations expose the metadata and we take care of the indexing of the harvesting um, and, and so on. If this is not possible, the stations still can uh, access the platform with the, with the provided APIs. So by implementing their uh, own scripts, they can uh, automatically uh, describe. Um, uh, they can automatically describe the metadata and upload it on the platform. If this also is not possible, uh, a form is provided to describe the data and to upload it. Uh, upload it to the the platform. Um, a few things that we wanted to point out is that. Uh, if your station is uh, equipped with a GIS service, such as GeoServer, GeoNetwork, Arc, Arc, uh, ArcGIS, uh, exposing metadata can be uh, a, a simple low effort configuration 
to allow automatization. So furthermore, if, if your data is hosted in, in any European or national data portal by specifying which data and how and where it was uploaded, uh, we can take care of the harvesting for you. So what we are proposing here um, to get a little bit more technical is, um, is this stack uh, that will um, comprise the, um, the platform. Um, CCAN, which is a data management system as the back end, and it will take care of the metadata harvesting, the data upload, uh, the processing, the indexing. It's all handled by this stack layer. And the stations will have direct access uh, to Seekan's backend API. Um, so they can interact with the platform, uh, consume the data, and also uh, submit it. Um, okay, okay. Uh, InterAccess is backend for TA users. Um, we will create a simple interface for uh, TA users to describe the metadata and upload the, the data set in the platform. And the Interact website will act as the user interface slash uh, front end. And it's where the user really interacts with all the functions of the metadata hub. Um, so the goal is to convert Interact to accommodate all new functionalities. So uh, it, might, it may become the main single entry point uh, for easy searching and, and defining of data sets. Um, I won't um, bore you too much with why we chose CCAN. It's uh, um, a robust platform that is uh, already chosen by uh, many um, uh, government, governments uh, and agencies uh, as their main public uh, data repository. Uh, Really, what what is great about Seekan uh, uh, is the uh, is the um, um, it allows for very powerful search across multiple data sets. So, um, in here we can um, we can see our our build for the testing environment we, I was talking about. Um, data sets uh, can be searched. Uh, through keywords and um, it can then be filtered out by organization or by topic groups are usually topics or um, projects that uh, that data sets attain to and tags tags are are keywords uh, that describe the data set um, so in this case we have permafrost emissions gas by selecting um, multiple of these filters, we can narrow down which data sets we want to find. Um, of course, there's also licenses that are, you can filter out uh, data sets through licenses. Um, and here we have the data sets that have been found by this search. Uh, here we have the available formats, the description of the data set, and um, and the title, so maybe this is the more uh, the, the more uh, interesting part for stations and for TA users. Um, in here, we create create and describe the data set. Um, we can give a title, description, tags that um, greatly improve uh, the data set searchability. Uh, usually it's uh, a comma separated list of keywords and phrases uh, that uh, um, really describe what the data uh, is, uh, is, uh, is describe, describing. Uh, a license can be, um, can be selected and if it's not available, um, it can be sent to us and we will upload it. Uh, and data sets are tied to an organization. So you choose which organization it's tied to, and uh, then it has the, the organization will uh, have the um, administrative um, privileges on the data set. Um, optional custom, uh, custom fields can be defined 
to better describe the data set. Um, and so, and also um, a maintainer and a maintainer email can be added so that um, a user can interact with, uh, with um, the person responsible of the data set. Um, well, as you can see, this is like uh, we have the Interact Station catalog that has been really successful and it is presenting information from, from your station on the network level. So what we are doing here is like an Interact Data catalog that it provides uh, the information on the data available uh, at the stations on the, on the whole Interact network level. Yeah. Okay, yes. So. Um, so uh, stations will be uh, organized in organizations and organizations will have uh, full control of the data they are, they are providing. Um, uh, uh, each station will be uh, accessible and uh, um, here we can access all the, the data from uh, a single um, station. Um, data can be tied to different topics groups can be either um, um, groups are used to either catalog uh, data by uh, theme by um, project by team etc cetera, etc cetera. and here we're creating a group so uh, what are our project milestones here uh, as Hanele was saying before we have started uh, prelim prelim preliminary tests with two, three stations, and uh, you are most welcome to um, join us in uh, uh, in this stage if you if you wish to to participate. Um, we are doing a, a few tests to um, truly understand what is the best approach uh, that we might take going forward. And so, as we uh, we finish these tests. Uh, development of the platform will start and um, we will maintain direct contact with, uh, with, the, with the stations so that we can understand what the stations needs are and fine-tune the platform to, for the stations. And uh, after this, uh, the platform will be open to all stations. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm uh, all ears. <laughs> if not, you can reach us at help at encode.it. Um, we will provide you this uh, presentation uh, in case uh, you might want to use it as documentation. Uh, we have provided here a QR code in case you want to save it to access um, the presentation going forward. And um, that, that is, that's all, if there's no further questions. Thank you, Raul. Really, really interesting and question, and it was actually easy for even me to understand. Does anyone have questions or comments to Raul? Oh, yes, yes, I know. I have a comment. Yep. Or a question. Um, I, I typed in the chat. Um, most of our data we submit to the Bangia, Bangia data portal. So it has a DOI. Um, I suppose you automatically harvest the data from such repositories, right? Yes, that is definitely possible. Um, we have to define the, the metadata in, in, uh, with, of the data set that we're operating with. So as I was uh, saying earlier with, in the slide, um, if you can provide um, where the data is, how it's stored, uh, uh, we can definitely take care of the harvesting. And then uh, also, the, yeah, please. Then just replied, yeah. yeah. And then also, I know station Samuel of data is also hosted in the in the Pangea data set. So, so there is uh, many stations data in in Pangea. So I'm sure that then a lot can be harvested from that the data set, and we just need the contact person for that and absolutely as, as long as we can qu query the database that is no no problem for us if if the database can interact with with uh, with us that uh, we will take care of that yeah thank you are there any other questions or does Eisten want to comment anything 
Uh, I don't have to. I just uh, <laughs> fungeo. I, I know that many are using it. It's it's yep. not straightforward to harvest mm. from fungeo. So I just added some comments in there. But it's quite important that if people push data to fungeo, and I want uh, encode to uh, to actually harvest from fungeo, uh, encode we uh, would uh, need to know the uh, the project that you have in fungeo. Yeah. And that's typically a name uh, of the type project and then some number. Then you can set up a dedicated OAI PMH harvest of the information from, from Pangeo. Good, that's really important information. And I think, I think also that now that, uh, that the, the station managers will hear from us with the question about these contact persons to the correct contact persons to virtual access uh, with the virtual access issue then it's it's very good that if you can the station managers can point out with the right people that to approach then this uh, in, we get this information then the easiest and best possible way and and the uh, in code can communicate directly then with these IT people to to find out the best solutions in any given situation how to do the harvesting uh, Marco, did you have any comments? No, no, no. Okay, I think that if there are no uh, further questions or comments at this stage, we are ready to uh, close the webinar from today. And I will uh, keep this recording and I will distribute it to all of you and uh, to all the other station managers who were not able to attend this time. And we will provide this recording together with the materials, the presentation slides of my presentation and ENCODE presentation. And you will also hear from us uh, in the TA coordination with the question about the virtual access contact people. And then once we have that list uh, updated and the group formed, then we will uh, start arranging this webinar uh, regarding the virtual access uh, provision and the development of this platform and then invite the virtual access uh, contact people to that webinar to, to continue the collaboration. And it also might be that, that you will hear directly uh, a little bit more uh, from INCODE uh, if they approach you with the, uh, uh, with the invitation to join in this testing uh, of the platform development and the metadata harvesting. So I hope in that case you are able to, to respond positively and that we can really get started in a nice and smooth way with these de developments. Okay, thanks so much for your time and for your questions and comments and have a nice rest of the day everyone. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot.